I recently picked up another classic Macintosh computer, this time a Macintosh Plus. In this video I'll go over the history and features of this model, describe the restoration of the unit and its accessories, and demonstrate it running. In another YouTube video entitled A Tale of Three Macs, I covered similar information for a Mac 512KE, Mac Classic, and Mac SE. The Mac Plus was the third model of the Macintosh line, introduced in January of 1986 at a list price of $2,599 US dollars, equivalent to about $6,400 in 2024. It came after the Mac 512K and before the Mac Classic and Mac SE. It was the first Macintosh model to feature a SCSI port and the first with user upgradable SIM memory modules. It shipped with one megabyte of memory but can be expanded to four megabytes. The internal three and a half inch floppy drive was upgraded over previous Mac models to double sided, expanding the capacity from 400 to 800 kilobytes. It's not compatible with the PC type three and a half inch drives, although later Mac models were. It was the last model to use an RJ11 keyboard port and DB9 mouse port. Later models used the Apple Desktop Bus or ADB like the mouse on the right. It sported the same screen size and resolution as earlier Macs. The keyboard was expanded to add an numeric keypad and cursor keys. When first introduced, the case of the Mac Plus computer's case was the same beige color as the original Macintosh, like this one. In 1987, the case color was changed to the warm gray platinum color. The Mac Plus was produced until October of 1990 when it was replaced by the Mac Classic. It was the longest produced Mac model until the Mac Pro in 2018. The basic features of the Mac Plus are the following. An 8 MHz 68000 CPU, 1 MB of RAM expandable to 4 MB, a 9 inch monochrome display with 512 by 342 resolution, keyboard and mouse, one internal 800K 3.5 inch floppy drive, two serial ports typically for printer and modem or Apple Talk network, and ports for an external floppy drive and for SCSI interface. The Mac Plus can run Mac OS versions System 3 through 7.5.5, although most users probably use System 6.0.8 as System 7 ran significantly slower on it. The front has the RJ11 or phone style jack for the keyboard as well as a video brightness control. A slot provides access to the internal floppy drive. The rear panel jacks from left to right are audio output, mouse connector, external floppy drive or external HD20 hard drive, SCSI interface for external hard drive or CD-ROM drives, and serial ports for printer and modem. Above them is the AC power connector. This unit has a third-party line cord with a surge suppressor, power switch, and behind a cover, the backup battery. Inside the case, the system, like earlier versions, contained two circuit boards and an internal floppy drive. There's no fan, a requirement that Steve Jobs insisted on, but which resulted in some failures due to the system overheating, particularly when fully loaded with memory. This unit has a third-party fan added, which I'll cover later. The analog board, identical to previous Mac versions, provides the 5-volt and 12-volt power for the logic board, as well as the circuitry driving the CRT. It has some adjustments for video display and power supply voltage. It drives the small cathode ray tube, or CRT. Note that if you work on the inside of a Mac, you need to discharge any high voltage that may be present, even after it's powered off. You can find instructions on the internet. The logic board is very similar to earlier Mac versions with the CPU, RAM, ROM, sound, floppy, and SCSI interfaces. The internal floppy was standard with the system with no official support for an internal hard drive. If no other drives were added, the system was usable with a single floppy drive, but typically required a lot of disk swapping between the operating system, applications, and data disks although not as bad with the earlier single-sided 400k floppies. I obtained this computer and accessories in late July of 2024 from a friend of my wife. They were the original owner and had not been used since the early 1990s. As I'll show, as well as the computer, mouse, and keyboard, it came with a stand, trackball, 
external floppy drive, external hard drive, a scanner, and some cables. I initially did some light cleaning of the outside of all the components and removed the battery, which fortunately had not leaked. I briefly powered up the unit and it came up and booted from a floppy. The mouse and keyboard worked. The floppy disk didn't eject and when moving the unit the screen was intermittent. Both symptoms are common issues with systems of this age. I then gave everything a good cleaning, opening up the keyboard and removing and cleaning all the keycaps. I did the same for the mouse and the case of the computer. I ordered recap kits for the video and logic boards and replacement gears for the floppy drives. I examined the two internal boards and they were in good shape. The unit reported the RAM installed as 2560K. This seemed an odd number, but it turned out that the owner had upgraded two of the four SIMs from 256K to one megabyte type, giving it two and a half megabytes of memory. I examined and cleaned the internal floppy drive, putting some grease lubricant on the areas that move when inserting and ejecting the disk. I thought that the issue with the floppy not ejecting would be the common problem of a small gear in the disk eject mechanism, which often becomes brittle and breaks, but it was fine. Once the drive was cleaned, it ejected floppies reliably. I also gave the other accessories an examination and light cleaning. I'll cover those later. Once the cap kits arrived, I recapped the analog board and the logic board. This was straightforward. The logic board has eight capacitors, of which seven are the same. All are axial through-hole electrolytic capacitors and easy to replace. The analog board has 20 capacitors of different values and types and takes more time to recap, but it's straightforward if you take your time. I find it helpful to mark the original capacitors with a black sharpie before they're replaced and to check the caps off on a printed list to minimize the chance of errors. I was still seeing intermittent video after recapping. The solder connections to the CRT looked good, but on closer inspection, there were almost invisible solder cracks on the connector. This is common and caused by heating and cooling of the analog board, which gets quite hot. I just needed to reflow the solder to correct this. Speaking of heat, this unit has an unusual device mounted on the floppy drive, marked Max Chill Memory. It's a cooling fan of piezoelectric type, which doesn't use a motor. It's powered by jumpers to the analog board, and two plastic strips move back and forth to move the air. It doesn't move a lot of air, but it's silent and uses little power. It helps reduce heat, especially when the memory's been expanded. The location on the top of the floppy drive doesn't look ideal, as most of the heat is at the top of the analog board. The battery, which is used to back up settings in the real-time clock, was dead. It's a type which is now very hard to find. For this machine, I went with a 3D printed holder which accepts three standard coin cells and adapts them to fit in the battery holder. I used an available 3D model which I printed. It also requires two bolts and a spring. This worked quite well. Once the battery was installed, I could set the date and time and they remained set when the units powered off. There is a Y2K type problem with the older versions of Mac OS. In settings, you set the last two digits of the year, but interprets a number like 24 as the year 1924 rather than 2024. There's a patch available which I installed. The serial number of a Mac can be decoded to show when it was manufactured. A website that decodes it says that my Macintosh Plus was the 9740th manufactured during the second week of 1986 in Fremont, California. As the Mac Plus was released on January 16, 1986, this would make it a very early unit. There were three versions of the ROM firmware, and this one has the oldest version, which got updated after the first two months of production, and the older case color, which changed in 1987. The Mac shipped without a reset switch, as it was felt that it should not be needed. However, during software development, programmers may often need to reset the computer. Apple provided a programmer switch, which could be installed and provided a reset button and an interrupt button which could be used to drop into a debug program. These small pieces of plastic were typically not installed by normal users and got lost over the years. For completeness, I 3D printed a programmer switch. I did one final modification. I have a blue SCSI version 1 disk emulator, which I'll demonstrate later. 
It normally gets its power from the SCSI connector, but the Mac Plus doesn't provide the so-called termination power. But they did allow for this by providing a location on the logic board to install a diode to enable termination power. I installed a 1 in 4001 diode at this location, which allows the Blue SCSI to be powered from the Mac and not require a separate power source. The Blue SCSI also requires a special configuration option to be enabled, telling it that it's being used with a Mac Plus. This is needed because the Mac Plus was released before the SCSI standard was finalized and it's not fully SCSI compliant, requiring some special handling. I'll demonstrate the system booting up in several ways as well as the accessories that came with it. First, booting system 6.0.8 from the internal floppy drive. It also came with an external floppy which is identical to the internal one but housed in a case and connects to the floppy connector on the back. When installed you have two 800k floppies available and you can boot from it if desired. I also have a unit called a floppy EMU which emulates a Mac or Apple II floppy drive but uses flash memory. It can also emulate an Apple HD20 hard drive. Here's the system booting from it in HD20 mode. As mentioned, I also have a blue SCSI SCSI disk emulator. It also stores disk images on a flash card and can emulate up to seven SCSI hard drives. Here I'm booting from it into System 7.1 with four drives, each one gigabyte in size. This unit came with an UltraDrive 45 hard drive from GCC Technologies. It's large and noisy, but works well, providing what was at the time a huge storage capacity of 45 megabytes. It uses the SCSI interface. Other accessories with this unit included the aftermarket swivel base that allows it to be easily rotated. It also has a third-party trackball, which can be used as an alternative to the mouse. It plugs into the mouse port and has a connector so you can still plug the mouse into it. Another item is this Thunder Scan. It was an early low-cost scanner. You needed to install the unit in an Apple ImageWriter dot matrix printer in place of the printer's ribbon cartridge. It has a small image sensor in it. By inserting a paper document in the printer, it would use the printer to move the image sensor over the document and scan it. Apparently it was quite effective and low cost. I'm unable to test it as I don't have an Apple ImageWriter printer. Finally, the unit came with two AppleTalk adapters. AppleTalk was an early low cost networking protocol developed by Apple that would allow connecting Apple computers in a local area network. Computers were connected in daisy chain fashion to the network using a serial port and adapter. I'm not intentionally collecting classic Macintosh computers but one is given to me or I have an opportunity to pick one up at a good price, I do so. So far I have four models. I still plan to do a few more upgrades to this system. I've ordered two more one megabyte SIM memory modules so I can upgrade the memory to the full four megabytes. I'm also planning to upgrade the ROMs to the latest version 3. The early first revision has a firmware issue that it hangs on power up if an unpowered SCSI device is present. New ROMs can be programmed into 27C512 EEPROMs. I may also replace the failure-prone gears on the internal and external floppy drives as a preventative measure. And I also plan to try getting AppleTalk running with another one of my Macs now that I have the required adapters.